Today, I have the great honor to present to you, introduce you our speaker, Tony Escamilla from Villa Home Inspection. Tony been with the industry for a long, long time. And we're so happy and thank you so much. Tony will share his knowledge of the inspection process, common funding, find, finding and critical parts to affect a real estate transaction. Please join in me to welcome Tony. Tony, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Pauline. I'm very happy to be here. Good morning, everybody. Um, happy to be here today. Happy Monday. Hope you had a great weekend. Um, it's going to be a fun class today. Um, I'm ready to go. I've got my water bottle here and I've got my gummy bears. So we are good. Um, let me uh, bring up my screen really quick. There we go. Can everybody see this okay? Yes, we're good. All right, very good. Um, so thank you all for being here today. I want to um, cover a lot of stuff that I believe is useful for you as a realtor in your transaction, having some basic knowledge of certain, some of the systems throughout the, um, the uh, house. Let me do one last thing here. I apologize. I'm trying to get this so that I can see it properly. There we are. Okay, here we go. So a little bit about myself. My name is Tony Escamilla. I am the owner and founder of Villa Home Inspections. Um, I have been in business for 22 years, since 1998. I've been a licensed general contractor for the last 20 years. Although I don't do any construction work anymore, uh, I do solely inspection work. Uh, I am an ICC certified residential construction inspector and a commercial construction inspector. I am NACHI certified home inspector and a Cal OES post disaster inspector for, uh, I work for the state uh, after earthquakes like the ones that we just had this weekend. And I hope everybody uh, fared it okay. Um, if different municipalities need help, they'll call on people like myself to go out and evaluate buildings after a major earthquake. I've conducted over 8,000 inspections personally. Um, so what's in this class for you? As a realtor, um, I know you have lots and lots of choices for training and I appreciate you being here today. Um, I, I try to present, whether it be on my website or my blog, uh, information that's gonna be valuable to you and to your clients. I don't like putting stuff out there that you're not gonna be able to use in, in practical day-to-day -day, um, applications. Uh, I have a lot of blog articles on my website. Here is the address if you want to check it out. A lot of what we're going to cover today is already uh, covered in greater depth in some of the blog posts that I have in, in the articles. And I'm constantly adding on to them, trying to find something that relates to the real estate transaction so that it makes things easier for everybody. Um, I'm going to make this say interactive. I'm going to make it a little bit of fun. Uh, I don't like boring classes. I've taken a lot of Zoom classes and given a lot of Zoom classes since um, this pandemic started, and I'm sure you have, and so I'm sure you don't want to sit through another long, boring, dry class. So we're going to try to make it interactive. I have some games, I have some prizes, and I have some good information. Uh, please feel free to ask questions. I can't exactly see the questions because I'm sharing the screen. Um, so maybe somebody can um, email them to me or let me know or just open up your mic and let me know if you have a question. We're going to take a question and answer session um, at the end, 
But as we go through the sections, I'm going to be asking if you have any questions and please feel free because I can't see the little pop up at the bottom. Just um, uh, shout it out. Uh, at the end of the day, knowledge is power. And the more knowledge you have and the, and the better quality knowledge you have, the better we will all be. I realize that not everybody uh, can stay for the entire uh, class. And I'm sure everybody's busy and sometimes people have to leave. And I do hope that you'll all stay for the entire class. But I want to say thank you for attending uh, right at the beginning rather than at the end. As a thank you to you, um, I have two free downloads for you. Um, no strings attached. Uh, this is my home maintenance manual. And feel free to take a look. Feel free to um, share this with your clients. It's about 100 pages long. It covers a lot of maintenance issues for your home has a lot of nice um, checklists for uh, seasonal maintenance before the rainy season, before the summer season. Um, great resource. And for you personally, how many of you here have uh, received a home inspection report or an appraisal or a termite inspection and you see a term in there that you have no idea what it means? Um, this guide will help you. It's got almost a thousand terms in there and explanations as to what they are. And I'm adding photos uh, to as many as I can. So I'll be updating it. And I'll also be doing a, um, and putting up on my website, a uh, pool maintenance manual soon. It's all digital downloads. They're all free. Feel free to use them and distribute them. This is the URL for that download. Um, it's not a public do, uh, URL, so you might want to screenshot it or write it down. And um, I hope you enjoy. So today, what we want to cover is um, what exactly is a home inspection? Um, as a realtor and me as a home inspector, I, I heard over the last 22 years many ideas of what a home inspection is and what it's not. Um, we're going to go over licensing versus trade certifications. Uh, educating the buyer, both on your side as a realtor and my side as a home inspector. Preparing for a home inspection, uh, both for the buyer and the seller. Industry standards of practice. What does a home inspection include? And more importantly, what does it not? Um, I have a lot of uh, misconceptions about what a home inspection should include and should not include. The day of the inspection, uh, some do's and don'ts for the day of the inspection. Inspe inspection basics, this is where we're gonna get a little interactive. We're gonna cover more technical aspects of certain things um, uh, that the inspection covers and hopefully give you some good information that you can use in, the, uh, in your day-to-day -day transactions. So you have your inspection report, now what? What do you do with your inspection report? Um, we're going to talk about estimates and requests for repairs. And then we're going to have a question and answer session. On the inspection basics, here's some of the things that we're going to cover. Uh, water heater basics. Plumbing basics. Carbon monoxide and smoke alarms. I get a lot of questions about that, by the way. I still get a lot of questions. Electrical basics. Uh, recalled panels. There's some dangerous uh, panels out there that I see on a regular basis. HVAC Freon phase out of 2020. Foundation basics. And fire safety. So, what exactly is a home inspection? Um, according to the California Business Profession Codes, a home inspection is a non-invasive physical examination performed for a fee in connection with a transfer of real estate, the mechanical, electrical, or plumbing systems, or the structural and essential components of residential dwelling of one or four units designed to identify material defects in those systems, structures, and components. Yada, yada. Um, this is almost the extent of what is written in the California law about home inspections. There's not a whole heck of a lot more in there as to what a home inspection should cover 
and dust cover. It's very generic. There are a few other things in the business and profession codes uh, pertaining to home inspections, but it's more for conflict of interest. For example, home inspectors can't work on any house that they have inspected within 12 months. They're not allowed to have a financial interest in, in the particular home or give or receive any financial uh, compensation to, to or from uh, interested parties, including realtors, uh, for conducting that inspection. So in lieu of having um, some laws um, pertaining to home inspection, there is certifications uh, and certifications by uh, some of the trade organizations. In California, there is no licensing requirement for doing home inspections. Anybody can say, I'm a home inspector and you're a home inspector. You put up a website, um, print some business cards, some flyers, some brochures and go pass them out. And I've seen some very impressive websites uh, recently from some inspectors that are new to the game and have only done about 10 inspections. Um, not to say that they don't know what they're doing, but um, uh, new inspectors, you probably wanna go with somebody with a little more experience. So in the map that you see here below, the dark states are the ones that require uh, licensing. In California, there is no licensing requirement. Uh, I'm a little on the fence whether there should be or shouldn't be licensing requirements. Sometimes that limits um, education. Um, and as you know, as a realtor, you have to have a lot of continuing education. And I think that some of the trade organizations do a better job at uh, ensuring that home inspectors have a, a good amount of continued education. Um, so how can you as a realtor protect yourselves and your clients from a uh, home inspector that doesn't have any experience and um, might put you in a bad position? There are four major trade organizations um, throughout the country for home inspectors. The first one is the International uh, Association of Certified Home Inspectors. They are the largest organization in the country. Uh, the next one is a little more uh, California specific. It's the California Real Estate Inspectors Association. I'm sure you've probably heard the term CREA. Um, they're very active in California. They are, they're very good um, uh, for advocating for uh, home inspectors in California. Uh, the American Society of Home Inspectors is probably the oldest um, trade organization in the country, also a very uh, good organization. And this is a good training organization for home inspectors, American home inspectors training. We also have two major code organizations. Um, I alluded to one earlier today. Uh, ICC is the International Code Council. Uh, the ICC writes and publishes the building codes that we all know today. If you pull a permit to build something on your house or add or construct a house, uh, the building inspector comes out to do his inspection and he's gonna inspect it based on the ICC codes. The ICC codes are adopted by the individual states and ICC codes are pretty much throughout the entire United States and then eventually get adopted to your local municipalities. And their examination process is grueling. It is months and months and months of uh, studying and a long grueling hair pulling exam for each one of the certifications. IAPMO is the other trade organization. It's the International Association of Plumbing and Mechanical Officials. And they write the plumbing code and the mechanical code for heating and air conditioning for the state of California. Um, all put together, all of these organizations are great. Um, if your inspector has a um, certification from one of these, it's great. If they have them from more, it's even better. Uh, at the end of the day, the more um, training that we have, education that we have, and continued education, uh, the better. Educating the buyer. Um, in 22 years of doing this, I am surprised sometimes that sometimes the buyers who come to me um, have very little clue when they're getting in, particularly home, first time home buyers, very little clue what they're doing when they come to me. I had one just the other day who called me and said, hey, I'd like to get a home inspection. 
um, I'm going to go look at some houses this weekend with my realtor. And I, I stopped them and I said, wait, wait, you're, you're not an escrow yet. No, no, we're going to go look at some houses. And so I wanted to get a home inspection. I had to stop them and say, hey, listen, you probably want to go look for a house, speak with your realtor, go look for the houses first, get approved, get a, a contract, open escrow. And I had to explain the whole process um, to the buyer. And as you can expect, the, the buyer was very nervous. It's their first time uh, a house, young couple. And so they, they're very nervous. Uh, they don't know what they don't know. And I think it's important for us uh, in the industry to try to educate buyers, particularly first time home buyers, as to what the process is the real estate process and the home inspection process. I have an article that I send um, buyers when we confirm an inspection. And I say, hey, I really think you should um, read this before the home inspection. And it breaks down what the home inspection is, what it isn't, and how the process is going to go with the home inspection. And I've seen a couple of realtors who put out um, similar stuff to what the process is of actually buying a house and what the steps are. Um, yeah, they don't know the process. Um, buyer's expectations sometimes are a, a little unreasonable. Uh, I had one the other day and uh, as I'm going through the inspection, the buyer is uh, following me and I'm and chatting about what's wrong with the house. And the buyer said, well, they're going to have to fix it. They're, they're just going to have to fix everything before escrow closes. And we kept going through the inspection like this. And at some point, the uh, listing agent was there and overheard the conversation and reached out to the buyer's agent and told the buyer's agent, hey, look, my seller is not doing anything. Um, so, uh, you know, I hate to take the, the winds out of their sails, but they're not going to do anything. The, buy, the house is completely as is, and they, they were really, really adamant that they weren't going to do anything. Um, ultimately, they ended up moving on to a new property. But I think if we temper buyer's expectations from the beginning, I think it makes our transaction a lot easier all the way around. Um, they're not buying a new house. And, and I think if buyers have that understanding that they're not buying a new house, um, I think their expert expectations will be tempered a little bit more. And they tend to get emotionally attached. Uh, I see this every day. Buyer comes in um, right at the beginning of the inspection. They are uh, measuring. They are already planning whose bedroom is what and they get emotionally attached. And then if something goes wrong with a house, then it's, it's a really big problem. Um, one of the questions I get a lot, and I'm sure you've probably heard this and you hear it more than I do is what do you think? Should I buy this house? Uh, and, and I, I chuckle a little bit every time I get that uh, question because I say, look, my home inspection is, is one small part to your transaction. There's a lot of things that go into your transaction, um, such as the price of the house, the comps, the appraisal, the loan, uh, the, the willingness of the seller to negotiate. There's a lot of things that go into it. So uh, I respectfully decline to uh, answer that question most of the time. But I think, again, the reason why I included this here, I think as we go through our day-to-day uh, -day, um, real estate transactions and inspections on my part, I think if we help educate these buyers from the get-go, I think the transaction just moves along a lot quicker. I get a lot of phone calls after the fact, after my inspection, um, from people who are trying to figure out what the process is. And then ultimately we end up doing conference call and getting everybody on the same page. And then it, it starts moving um, a lot easier. So uh, any questions? All right, I will move on. Preparing for a home inspection. Let's see, preparing for a home inspection for the seller. Um, I, I go in to do uh, home inspections and sometimes I'm just floored by some of the things that I, that I see. And so I think that uh, for listing agents, if you, and I know 
everybody does this and you tell your, your sellers um, what they should and shouldn't do. And sometimes the sellers do, sometimes they don't. But uh, a few tips for sellers to get ready for a home inspection. Um, I had one this weekend that pertains exactly to this bullet point. Um, disclose known problems. If, uh, if the buyer finds out that uh, I found out something that should have been disclosed, the buyers become very skeptical very quickly. I had one this weekend that had a, actually it started two weeks ago. We did the inspection two weeks ago. And then uh, last weekend they called us back to do a sewer line inspection because there was something wrong with uh, the sewer line, but the, the seller hadn't disclosed it. And so I went to go do the sewer scope and you'll see a picture a little bit later on uh, in the presentation and the sewer line was completely, completely blocked with tree roots. And so I left and they called the plumber. The plumber came in, said, yeah, we cleared out the roots. You're all good to go. We, we saw that it was fine. And so the listing or the buyer's agent um, requested the pictures and the video and they did not have pictures or video. And, and, the, and the buyer's agent said, well, I thought you saw that it was okay. So they brought me out and sure enough on a four inch pipe about this big, they had cleared out about that much of the roots and the rest of it was still there. I managed to get the camera through, got about another 10 feet in, completely blocked up again. And so now they're having to do, to deal with all of that. And I, I think that deal is gonna fall apart because the, the buyers lost complete trust in, in the listing, um, uh, in the list, well not the listing agent, but the seller. And so I think the, one of the best ways that sellers can help themselves is to disclose, disclose, disclose. Uh, make things accessible. Uh, a lot of the times I end up having to go back to uh, an inspection and um, reschedule and it slows down your transaction. And then and it also ends up costing the buyer more for me to come back out because I can't get into an attic, uh, particularly on older houses. Buyers want me to get inside the attic. I can't get into the crawl space. I had one the other day that they had tiled over the entrance, the entire entrance of the, uh, of the crawl space. And they ended up having to break that out so I can get underneath the, uh, the crawl space. Uh, the water heater, the electrical panel, very um, frequently I cannot open the electrical panel because uh, the panel sometimes is in the garage and there's shelves, there's furniture, there's uh, all kinds of stuff. Or if it's outside, there's large grown, uh, overgrown bushes that I can't get through. And of course the HVAC system. Um, consider a pre-sale inspection. Um, I'm surprised that uh, on average, maybe about 10% of my business is um, pre-sale inspections. And sometimes the sellers will call me and say, hey, look, I'm thinking of putting it on the market. Um, let's do the inspection so I can know what we're dealing with and I can disclose everything. When the time comes, their transaction goes through uh, a lot easier. Smoke and carbon uh, monoxide alarms, these are, these are the typical things that the most sellers should do or take a look at before they put the house in the market. Smoke and carbon, touch up any flaking paint, check for leaks uh, under sinks, loose toilets, things like that. Um, what happens that when we go in as home inspectors, if we see one thing, we'll look at another, it's like a big puzzle that we do. and. Um, as they start adding up, we start looking a little bit closer because we realize that there's a lot of maintenance issues. So we look a little bit closer and a little bit closer. And these are minor things that can be taken care of um, fairly easily. Does the HVAC work? Uh, a lot of the time the seller hasn't used the HVAC in a long time and it's just uh, behooves them to just turn it on, make sure it's working fine. Uh, if it's not on, the home inspector won't turn it on. And then we usually end up uh, having to come back and that slows down your transaction. And don't do any sloppy repairs. Uh, I've seen a lot of caulking jobs. I've seen a lot of paint jobs that have um, looked pretty horrendous. Uh, the only thing that that does is make us look a little bit deeper. Any questions? Make sure I have this on 
properly. Okay, before we move on. So industry standards of practice, and this is where I get a lot of um, misconceptions about home inspection. What does a home inspection include? And more importantly, what does it not include? Um, I get a lot of questions as to, well, why didn't you take a look at the, uh, you know, or why didn't you look for mold? Um, well, it's not part of the inspection. Uh, we'll look for, for signs of it. Most of the um, standards of practice uh, on those trade organizations that I talked about earlier share some similar things. Every trade organization has their own standard of practice of how the inspector should conduct their inspection but most of them are very similar in these three different ways. The inspector shall describe, um, and that's how it starts, the inspector shall describe the system, whatever the system may be, whether it be the uh, heating and air conditioning system or the electrical system uh, or the plumbing. What type of material do you have? Do we have copper plumbing? Do we have galvanized plumbing? Do we have a combination of both? We're gonna describe what the, uh, the system is, and then we're gonna report uh, any corrections that are needed. Um, in this case, you have galvanized plumbing and there is a considerable amount of rust. Um, that is a material defect as it's known in the uh, industry. The age of the system is not in itself a material defect. For example, if you have older original plumbing to the house, that is not a material defect and, and not in need of correction. And sometimes I get, well, why didn't you put that down? It's old. Uh, yes, it's old, but unfortunately it's still fine. There's no leaks, there's no visible rust. Um, it is old and I try to put down what the material is. In some cases, um, uh, water heaters and HVACs, um, I do put down the age of, of the system uh, when it's visible. And then here's a part where everybody um, gets a little confused, what the inspector is not required to do. Now, that having been said, these standards are minimum standards. Now, most inspectors honestly go much above the, the standards of practice. And we, we look at things and we talk about things much above what these minimum standards are. For example, um, the uh, inspector is not required to do anything that may, in the inspector's opinion, be unsafe or dangerous to himself or others or damage the property. That kind of goes without saying. Um, if there's something unsafe or we feel that there's something that's going to damage the property by doing our inspection, we're not going to do it. For example, electrical panel covers. Uh, I run to electrical panel covers all the time that are plastered into the wall. And in trying to remove that electrical panel cover to see inside, if I try to remove it, I'm gonna break all of the plaster all the way around the wall. And so we end up not opening up that electrical panel and sometimes we get called back and the homeowner will, will then provide access and then we'll get inside. Um, is not required to operate any system that does not turn on with the use of normal operating controls. If the system doesn't turn on, we are not going to turn it on. And I'll give you a, an example. I've been doing this for 22 years and unfortunately I've had a, a, some interesting experiences. I've been electrocuted twice. I've had a heater blow up on me once um, and, and a few other things. But in this particular case, there was a, a furnace that was not on and um, the buyer really wanted me to operate the furnace and we wanted to go turn on the pilot and it wasn't turning on and it wasn't turning on and thankfully that day i was wearing a baseball cap and as i looked down um i saw a flash of uh flame come across me and it burned all my my arms um uh, took most of the hair off of my face because it was a there was a leak inside the system and that's why it had been shut off there was a leak inside the system there was a pocket of gas when it finally did ignite the whole thing just blew up uh, kicked me back and then um, yeah uh, inspection was over at that point but anyways this is why we don't turn things on uh, inspector is not required to determine the cause uh, of the uh, correction uh, we don't diagnose what's wrong with, uh, with it and the, uh, I'm going to get to it in, in a second but there's a term or a phrase that most realtors hate us uh, to say 
and uh, it should be coming up right here. We're not uh, required to predict the, the service life of uh, any system. Um, I get this question a lot. Uh, how old is a roof? Um, how much lifespan do you think we still have on that roof? And I can predict that as a general contractor, I'm allowed to talk about certain things that other home inspectors are not allowed to talk about. Uh, because you, if you're not actually licensed or specialized in a particular field, uh, you're not allowed to talk about those things. And that's why you get that cookie cutter um, phrase in your reports a lot. So uh, I'll try to give them a ballpark and say, hey, you have between you know X and X uh, lifespan left on, on that roof. But generally, you're going to see, and I'm sure you've already experienced that home inspectors try to stay away from giving you life expectancy. And this is the the phrase I'm talking about. Further evaluation uh, by a licensed contractor is recommended. Um, I, I, I hate using the term, uh, the, the phrase myself, but I, I tell buyers um, and, and even realtors, a home inspection is a general inspection. It's kind of like when you go to the doctor and your doctor hears something unusual in your heartbeat, um, the doctor's not gonna diagnose it right there. He's going to refer you to a specialist who's going to take a, a better look, do some more detailed tests of your heart and be able to diagnose exactly what's, what's wrong with it and give you a, a course of action. Um, and so it's very similar what we do. If I find something that I can't figure out, I'm going to recommend that somebody else, a, a specialized person, take a look at it. And I know it's very frustrating, um, but you want your buyer to get the best possible opinion from the most qualified person for that particular pr um, problem. So if we find something and we realize that there's something wrong, um, then you move on to getting a more specialized, more detailed uh, opinion. Any questions? Okay, so the day of the inspection. The day of the inspection, a few tips for the buyers. Um, I have an article, like I said, that I send out to buyers on a regular basis and say, hey, listen, um, here's a few tips for your inspection process so that it, it makes it a little bit easier for you. So before they get there, they've already read this. They know what the process is. They know what to expect. And it makes the transaction, the, the inspection, a lot smoother. Um, plan to be at the inspection. Um, I mean, this one goes without saying, but you'd be amazed how many people don't show up for their own inspection. If you're buying a six, $700,000 house and you're paying me $400 to come and do your inspection, it really behooves you to be at the inspection so you can get the best possible experience, the most value for your inspection. Um, know what's included and what's not included. Uh, what we talked about, I cover as, as well so that they can have an idea of what is and what is not included. For example, I don't test for mold um, or I don't test for asbestos. If I see it, um, I'll point it out. I'll recommend that you have it tested, but we don't actually do for it. And I think once the um, buyer knows this, it makes it a lot easier. Leave the kids and family at home. Um, I had one, I kid you not, this was uh, about a week and a half ago. Uh, the buyer showed up with nine people. Uh, I, I, I can't make it up, nine people, four of them were small kids. And we were doing the inspection, came to do the, uh, the summary at the end of the inspection. Uh, the kids are running around, one of them is crying, mom had to leave the room, dad stayed. Um, needless to say, um, after the inspection and they got the report, I got a lot of phone calls with questions. And I don't have anything, honestly, against um, you know people being at the inspection. I just, it, it's a very exciting time for buyers. Um, they want to show the house off to their friends, their family. Um, I think it's just better done uh, at a separate appointment um, to go back with the family. I think, again, if you're going to pay me to come and do an inspection or any other, other home inspector to come and do your, the inspection, you want to get the most out of it. and You want to be able to concentrate, ask questions, look at things, uh, get a good understanding as to uh, what the inspection is covering and what it's not. Um, leave Uncle Bob at home. Uncle Bob, uh, Uncle Bob is that 
well-meaning um, family member, uh, uncle, brother, brother-in-law, friend, um, who has some experience in one of the trades or sometimes a lot uh, are, are very experienced. I had a building inspector show up uh, one time who was a father-in-law of my buyer. And um, they want to, of course, take care of their friends or, or family members and they have a lot of questions. They, uh, they'll they follow me around and they, they, they want to prove that they know what they're talking about. Um, unfortunately, it, it serves to distract from the home inspection. If you've done one of the things that, that's in that article, if you've done your homework so far as a realtor or a home inspector, you've Research your home inspector, you look at their qualifications, you look at their reviews, recommendations, you know that they are a good home inspector. Um, you should be confident that this person is going to do a good job, they're going to be looking out for you. Um, so I, I always recommend leave Uncle Bob at home. Um, and let the inspector concentrate. I, uh, you know, I, I have Uncle Bob or sometimes buyers or agents um, who have a, a lot of questions and um, the most value that a, a buyer or even as an agent for, like yourself, you're going to get out of a home inspection is if the home inspector is able to do their job. And then at the end, we'll sit with you, discuss what needs to be discussed, show you walk around the property, describe things. Um, and so, yeah. Um, bring a pad, a uh, pad and paper, uh, it's supposed to say a pen and paper for notes. Uh, a lot of things happen very quickly for buyers and uh, it's a lot of information to take in. So I always recommend that they bring a pad um, and a pen to take some notes down. Uh, bring a measuring tape. Uh, you can measure for appliances. Um, I had my, my own other inspector uh, just recently bought a house. He bought this really nice house and he measured everything like he's supposed to do. Um, brought in his um, refrigerator fit perfectly in there, open the doors and the doors didn't open properly because they hit, I think it was the cabinet or the stove or something like that. And these are the opportunities that as a buyer, um, buyers have to measure things to decide where they're gonna put things, um, measure windows for uh, window treatments, measure bedrooms for furniture. So I always recommend that they bring a measuring tape and that they bring a camera. Um, they're, not, they're not gonna remember what they saw when they're at the inspection. So take as many pictures and as many measurements as possible. And it also keeps them um, busy uh, during the process. And then at the end, we can go through and they're gonna see a lot of stuff as they walk through the house. They're gonna see a lot of stuff. They're gonna have a lot of questions and then we'll do a walkthrough at the end of the inspection and answer any questions that they may have, uh, point out things that we saw. Um, and as a contractor, I give them ideas, uh, home improvement ideas that they, they always ask, hey, can, you, can we tear down this wall here? We wanna make this open. And so we'll do all of that typically at the end of the inspection. Um, general tips, uh, should you as the agent be at the inspection? Absolutely. Yes. Um, after doing about 8,000 inspections, you would be amazed how many people don't show up for the inspection. Um, and uh, sometimes I'm there with a buyer, only the buyer. Sometimes I'm there with a buyer and the listing agent. And I get a lot of phone calls after the fact. Um, in, my inspection report is very one dimensional. There's going to be some jargon in the report. There's going to be pictures in the report. And it's not the same thing as actually being at the inspection, being able to ask questions, being able to talk about it with a buyer and um, not have to wonder, well, well what did the uh, inspector mean when he put this down? And what does this picture uh, uh, cover? Um, I, I highly recommend it. Um, some agents, uh, lately I've been getting a lot of agents who ask me, Hey, your inspection starting at noon. Can we show up about one thirty or one forty-five, knowing that my inspection is going to be about two, two and a half hours long. I'm like, yeah, that's perfect. That gives everybody plenty of time to do whatever they need to do. And then we sit down and we discuss everything with the buyers and, um, and, and yourself, the agent. Should the homeowner be there? Um, I, I don't recommend that the homeowner be there if at all possible. 
I've had some interesting experiences with home inspectors, I mean, uh, homeowners um, over the years. Um, homeowners are just as emotional as uh, home buyers in that they're moving, they're buying something else. It's a big lengthy uh, transaction. Um, Mr. Homeowner follows me around half the inspection pointing out how in 1978 he added this uh, electrical fixture. In 1982 he did this. And then at the end of the inspection, when I sit down to do my, my verbal summary and I point out to the buyer how Mr. Home and, uh, homeowner's electrical work was done incorrectly, uh, Mr. Homeowner doesn't like it and gets very defensive, um, argumentative. Um, in one case many, many years ago, I actually got well, everybody got thrown off the property. Is the, this really nice older man um, was going through and he heard me saying and talking to the buyer pointing out defects and I can see the steam coming out of his ears and at some point at the during the summer he said that's it I'm done uh, I'm not selling the property anymore get off my property and he kicked everybody out so um, if at all possible I always recommend that the homeowner not be there Any questions? All right, let's see, I don't see. Feel free to unmute yourself if you have any questions. I don't Sorry. have the- Tony, yes, they're not able to unmute themselves. They're just gonna have to type it in the text box. There are a couple. Uh, okay, I can't see the text box for, for okay, some Okay, we save it at the end. Um, Pauline will read the questions at the end. Very good. Okay. Just wanted to make sure that I okay. didn't leave anybody uh, unheard. Okay. Thanks. So I'll, I'll go ahead and move on. So this is where it gets a little interesting. I'm going to play a game here and there's going to be a prize. Um, if, well, they're not able to unmute themselves, so I guess we won't be able to do this, but maybe they could drop it in the, um, in the chat box and then we'll go back and see who actually got this right. Can anybody tell me what the requirements for smoke alarms is? This is the number one question that I get from realtors still. Um, where should my smoke alarms be installed? So I'll let you go ahead and do that. Um, smoke alarms, the California residential code says that smoke alarms shall be installed in each, inside each sleeping room. I get a lot of questions still. Well, there's one in the hallway. I thought that was good enough. Um, no, you want one inside each sleeping room and you want one outside each sleeping room room in the immediate vicinity, and this is the important part, in the immediate vicinity of the bedrooms. Um, I see a lot of uh, smoke alarms that are installed in the living room, and there's nothing in the hallway, and I write it down that the uh, smoke alarms are missing, and sure enough, um, for whatever reason, smoke alarms are the things that set people off, uh, and carbon monoxide alarms, I'll get a phone call or an email saying, the homeowner just called me and said that the smoke alarms are in place, and and I have to point out, well, yeah, it, it was in place in the living room. Um, we need it outside of the bedrooms. That's, that's where they're required. Um, one on each additional story of the dwelling, including basements and habitable attics. Uh, the key term here is habitable. Um, if the room is not habitable, a habitable attic is a finished attic with drywall flooring, uh, things like that. If the attic is not habitable, it's not required to have a smoke detector. And the same thing with basements, not required to have a smoke detector. Split levels, you'll see townhomes, particularly in the San Fernando Valley, I see a lot of them where the dining room is a little bit uh, higher up than the uh, living room. You can put the smoke alarm on the upper level, you don't need one for the lower level. And you need one on each level uh, of the house. So even in the lower level, if there are, if you have living room, family room, kitchen in the lower level, there's no bedrooms, you still need a smoke alarm uh, on that level as well. Uh, smoke alarm shall not be less than three feet horizontally from a bathroom that contains a bathtub or a shower. We came to find out, unfortunately, that um, steam sets off um, smoke alarms. So if at all possible, unless it prevents you from actually putting up a smoke alarm, you want to keep it at least three feet away from uh, bathrooms that have a shower or a bathtub. 
And there's a couple of other um, requirements for smoke alarms, but I'm not gonna go into every single detail about this because we could be here um, pretty much all day. But these are the, the main uh, smoke alarm requirements. Uh, carbon monoxide, uh, same thing. Anybody who can tell me the carbon monoxide alarm um, requirements, drop them in the chat box and I'll take a look at them uh, at the end of the uh, presentation. Carbon monoxide alarms are required and I get this a lot as well. A lot of questions about these, where they're required. They're required outside each sleeping area in the immediate vicinity of the bedrooms. Because there are so many different types of uh, carbon monoxide alarms, there's a, the one that's in the picture here that goes on the wall. There's one that goes on the ceiling. There's one that you can plug into an electrical outlet. Um, I see carbon monoxide alarms most of the time in the wrong places. Um, same thing if you have a hallway and the bedrooms are down the hallway, uh, the, smoke, the carbon monoxide alarm is not going to do you any good in the living room. Um, or I will see a carbon monoxide alarm installed inside the bedroom, which is great. I, I mean, uh, there's nothing wrong with putting it inside the bedroom, but you want to have it outside the bedroom as well. I, I frequently tell people by the time that the carbon monoxide alarm gets in the bedroom, goes, travels across the bedroom to the opposite wall where the alarm is there, you're already in trouble. Um, so the idea is that you want to catch carbon monoxide before it enters the bedroom. Um, same thing with um, carbon monoxide alarms. You need one on, uh, on any occupiable level of the dwelling, regardless of what, whether they're sleeping areas or not. I get this a lot in townhomes that have lofts uh, on the upper level. You still require to have one up on the loft, even if you have one down uh, in the living room area. Same thing with basements. Um, anywhere there is fuel burning appliances located in a bedroom or the attached bathroom. And we'll get, we'll touch into this a little bit more when we get to um, water heaters. There are certain things that you should not have in a bedroom and, and that's gas operated appliances. And one of the reasons why you don't want a gas operated appliance in the bedroom or the adjacent bathroom is because of carbon monoxide. In that case, you are, you are then required to have a carbon monoxide alarm inside the bedroom, but you're still required to have one outside the bedroom as well. Uh, a combination carbon and smoke alarm um, is permitted in lieu of uh, individual. Up in the hallways, if you get a combo unit, instead of installing the, the uh, carbon and the smoke separately, a combo unit will suffice just great. Um, last but not least on carbon monoxide alarms, they need to be installed uh, per manufacturer's instructions. I see some of the carbon monoxide alarms, the little ones that are about this big, and you see them on the wall all the time. And they're, they're meant to be installed about four feet off of the floor. I see those on the ceiling. Um, or worse yet, I'll see them uh, on a bookshelf, just laying on top of a bookshelf or laying on top of the uh, television um, cabinet. But yeah, they, they're designed very specifically to be in a specific place. So they have to be installed per the manufacturer's instructions. Water heaters. Um, have a lot of information about water heaters because this is probably the thing that I write down the most during home inspections. Um, plumbing is the number one issue with home inspections and water heaters is very, very high on, on, on that list. Water heaters, um, prohibited locations is what we just talked about right now. Um, in bedrooms, uh, you don't wanna have a water heater in the bedroom. Up until a few years ago, and I, I disagree with this code change, they were not allowed in, uh, to install a water heater in a bedroom closet, uh, a gas operated water heater in a bedroom closet. There's, uh, I, I joke with people and I tell them there's about 10 different things that can go wrong with your water heater and about half of them can kill you. And this is one of them. Um, there are some exceptions in the new code for new construction. And new construction says that you can have a water heater inside a bedroom closet as long as you have a tight fitting self-closing door and that all of the combustion air for the water heater is taken directly from an exterior wall. 
Um, those little vent openings that you see on the closets for water heaters, there's one on top and there's one down below. Well, those are required in that situation to be on the outside wall so you can get your air from the outside wall and not from inside the bedroom. Same thing holds true for clothes dryers. I see a lot of um, upgrades and remodels where um, laundry connections are installed in bedroom closets. Uh, the dangers are gas leaks and carbon monoxide. Um, anything that has gas, natural gas attached to it um, can leak. The good news is that natural gas, you can typically smell carbon monoxide alarm, unfortunately, uh, carbon monoxide, unfortunately, you can't smell. In the garage, your water heater is required to be 18 inches off of the ground. And if anybody can tell me why it's required to be 18 inches off the ground, please drop it into the comments. And um, there's gonna be some prizes at the end of the um, presentation. But um, the reason, unfortunately, that it required to be 18 inches off of the ground is because as the building codes change, we found tragically that um, if you have the, the, the Two most likely places you're gonna have a fire in your house is in your kitchen and your garage. And in your garage, you tend to store uh, chemicals. You, you put gasoline, you have a lawnmower with gasoline that has oil, you have paint, you have solvents like paint thinner, cleaners, uh, paint cans, things like that. If those are too close to your water heater, that open flame, can pick up those fumes if they're too close and cause an explosion. And so that's why they're required to be uh, 18 inches uh, off of the ground. Um, and just look around your garage when you get home. Is there anything too close to your uh, water heater burner? Most people don't, don't realize or don't remember that inside that water heater, you have an open flame. Anything near that open flame can be a hazard. Um, and they should be. On older houses, this is not a requirement. If you look at the picture on the screen, those two posts right there are called bollards. I don't know why, but they're posts um, to uh, prevent vehicle damage. On new construction, they're required. If it's in the way of travel, uh, the uh, vehicle, those are required or very highly recommended, and I'll show you why. This actually happened in Westminster two years ago. That car uh, hit the gas instead of hitting the brakes took out the water heater and caused an explosion. Uh, this is an apartment building, actually caused an explosion. Luckily, nobody died, but three people were hospitalized because of it. Strapping, um, water heater strapping, one third of the way up and one third of the way down um, is where the water heater straps should be. I get a lot of phone calls saying, well, the straps were there and you called them out as not being installed or not being installed properly. If there is one water heater strap in the middle of the heater, that's not good enough. Sometimes I'll find it at, right at the very top of the water heater. Um, and when that starts shaking in an earthquake, that, that strap will fall right off and the water heater will fall over. Um, so that's basically it. They have to be approved straps. They can't be plumber's taped. Um, you can buy the little kit for like $20 at Home Depot. Um, protecting the gas is the gas line. Again, gas, gas, gas. Protecting the gas line is what we're concerned with. In case of an earthquake, if your water he heater tips over, uh, we're not that concerned with a water line. Uh, it, it will flood your place, unfortunately, but if the gas line ruptures, it could blow up your place or cause a fire. So it's all about the gas, protecting the gas line. Um, for water heaters. Approved straps, no plumber's tape. Plumber's tape is that metal tape that's about three quarters of an inch or an inch um, wide and has a lot of little holes on it. That's not allowed for, uh, for water heaters. And the gas line, getting back to the gas line. Uh, the gas line must be accessible. I, I run into this a lot. Um, Mr. Homeowner decides he wants to replace his 40 gallon uh, water heater with a 50 gallon, and that's, it's a great idea. Um, fits it in the closet, gets everything going, and I come and do the inspection, and now the gas valve, the shutoff valve, is directly behind the water heater. 
in a tight little closet. Um, so in the event of an emergency, you can't shut the gas off. Um, that gas valve is required to be accessible so you can shut it off in case of an emergency, uh, a gas leak, uh, earthquake, or any other reason. And the flexible gas connector, that little yellow connector that you see on stoves, you see it on clothes dryers, you see it on water heaters, it's a very thin flexible metal and it's not allowed to protrude through anything through a cabinet, through a floor, through a wall, through anything basically, because it is very delicate. Um, here's one, a picture that I took. This was one of my inspections. Um, beautiful installation, 99% uh, of the installation, brand new water heater, did a great job and then put the um, gas line right through the sheet metal. So in the event of an earthquake, what would happen, once that sheet metal starts shaking, it'll shear off that gas line. Now you have an open gas line. So the uh, ideal thing to do would be to run a rigid pipe right through and then put the, pit, the gas connector inside. Uh, combustion air, we talked about getting enough uh, openings, those two openings on top and the bottom to get enough oxygen for the burners. If your burners don't burn properly, they're going to create carbon monoxide. And it's not that big of a deal if the water heater happens to be located outside. But if the water heater is inside the house, I find on older houses, I find them in the kitchen, I find them in the laundry room, hallway, closet, um, then you're spilling carbon monoxide back into the house. And your temperature pressure relief valve. On the picture um, that I have on the screen, you'll see it on the upper right hand side of the water heater. That valve is designed to open up if the temperature in the heater in the in the tank gets too high or the pressure gets too high to prevent it from exploding. I had one recently where a um, tenant was being uh, asked to relocate because the seller sold the property. Tenant was not happy about it. What did they do? They went to the little control knob uh, for the water heater as they were leaving, turned it all the way up and when we got there about two or three days later to do the inspection, we were wondering why there was flowing water out in the backyard and why it was steaming. Came to find out that thankfully, the TPRV valve opened up and was just flowing hot water, God knows for how long, uh, out into the backyard because had that not happened, um, this would have happened. Right there, this is an actual water heater explosion in phoenix arizona a few years back took out half of that garage um i i, I see it frequently when that tprv starts leaking rather than replace it most people will buy a dollar cap uh, or a plug and they'll plug it up um not a good idea okay Anybody who could tell me what's wrong with this picture, please drop it into the uh, uh, comment box. There's gonna be a, a prize and I'll show you what the prize is. Uh, I'll tell you what's wrong with this right now. This is a water heater. So you get one of our awesome new measuring tapes for your glove compartment. Um, so anybody who I've uh, mentioned who's, who uh, uh, put something in the, in the comment box, We'll send you one of these. Um, I find that realtors are always in need of a measuring tape to measure something at an inspection for themselves or for their clients. So um, I'll be happy to send these out to you. Uh, what's wrong with this um, vent pipe? This is a water heater vent pipe and you'll see the plastic heating ducts completely in contact with this um, vent pipe. That vent pipe gets really, really, really hot. And um, I wish I would have been able to find the other picture that I have. I have one that shows the heating duct completely melted around the, uh, the vent pipe. And where it protrudes the wall uh, also needs a separation. Um, it's a fire hazard. And so um, those are the type of things that we find uh, for water heaters. So venting, we'll talk about venting. It must terminate at least one 
foot above the roof. The vent pipe must terminate one foot above the roof because if it doesn't, then you get improper uh, ventilation and then the vent gases, instead of going outside, will spill inside. In this case, it was a garage, it'll spill inside the garage or back inside the house. And it must slope uh, upward at all time. I see water heaters in basements and older houses where the uh, vent pipe is at a negative slope and that will never vent properly and you'll get, again, carbon monoxide. And it must have adequate uh, clearance from combustible materials. Um, plumbing, I was considering and putting this presentation together for you, what I wanted to cover in plumbing because it is such a vast uh, um, area to cover that, um, and, and not a lot of it applies to your transaction um, as realtors. So um, sewer line, I get a lot of questions about sewer lines. Should I do a sewer line inspection? What do you think? Um, so I have an article on my blog that discusses this as well as to when you should and should not get a, uh, a sewer line inspection. And in all reality, you don't always need one. Um, there are lots of circumstances where you don't need one. So uh, if the property is older, it's definitely uh, um, time to consider a sewer line inspection as part of the process or recommend one to your buyer. Um, you, it might have, I'm sure you've seen the, the, the old clay pipes. They, they look just like potter. Brick pipes used to be used primarily in the East Coast, but we, there are pockets here in the San Gabriel Valley where I ran into orange bird pipes. And orange bird pipes was a, uh, a sewer pipe that was made with a fibrous material. It, it looked almost like a cast and it was, they use actual wood fibers. And what we came to find out is wood fibers, not the best material to use because what happened over time is that as that, those pipes got wet, they actually pancaked out like this. They didn't break, they just pancaked out and, and caused a lot of blockages. So if you have an older house, those are the two possibilities that you have. If there's a long distance between the house and the street, um, that is a big indicator of possibly uh, having sewer line issues. Um, over time, soil tends to settle uh, unevenly for different reasons uh, on older houses and causes dislocations in the pipe, uh, what we call offsets, dislocations or complete breaks in the pipe. Um, expansive soil, we'll talk about expansive soil a little bit more uh, under foundations. Expansive soil is exactly what it says. Um, it's a clay-like soil. You've probably seen this. You can go out and look in your own house if you want. And there's a lot of pockets in, uh, in the San Gabriel Valley. Uh, Hawthorne has a big, huge pocket in some areas of, around downtown Los Angeles. It's a dark, dark, dark brown soil. And when it dries, it cracks. You've probably seen pictures of what it looks like in a desert when the soil cracks. Well, that's what it looks like. Um, the problem with expansive soil is that when it expands, it pushes up, it pushes up against the sewer lines and it disconnects the sewer lines. But then when it dries in the hot summer months like we just had, it shrinks. And now the sewer lines and in some cases foundations will settle and they'll, they'll settle unevenly and then you have dislocated pipes. And that's one of the reasons you should consider a, a sewer line inspection. Earthquakes, of course, um, like the one that we just had um, this weekend, uh, earthquake uh, moves the soil uh, unevenly. Large trees in the yard. Large trees in the yard is what I was just referring to um, about the one that I did this uh, this week. And here's the picture that I was talking about this week. And you can see the date up on top. Um, they cleared out the sewer, the uh, the roots uh, on a four inch pipe gave me about an inch and a half um, of, of clear space for the sewer to drain. And that's gonna clog up again in about two weeks. And then there was another blockage about another 10 feet in. So large trees in the front yard are your always, always, always your biggest indicator that you might need a sewer line inspection. And of course, known issues with drainage. If the seller is um, disclosing any known issues, then you absolutely, absolutely want to get a sewer line inspection. But you don't always need a sewer line inspection. I came, uh, um, I've had a, a few similar situations like this where 
the buyer said, hey, there's large trees in the front yard. Uh, they order the sewer line inspection. We get to do the, the home inspection. And I said, listen, you don't, I'll do the sewer line inspection if you want me to, but you don't need it. And here's why you don't need it. Because in one situation, it was a corner lot and the, the trees were in the front yard, but I came to find out during the inspection that the sewer lines actually drained in the opposite side of the house on the other street around the corner, which only had like a 10 foot run between the house and the street. And there's no trees, there's no bushes, there's nothing there. Um, I said, you don't really need it. Um, they ended up wanting to do it regardless, but they really didn't need it in that situation. A lot of houses in certain areas of San Gabriel, um, Temple City, um, still has some alleys in the back and sometimes the sewer line goes and drains into the alley. So even if you have trees in the front yard, if your sewer line is draining into the back alley, uh, you don't need a, a, a sewer inspection. So these are the most typical things, that, the questions that I get regarding uh, plumbing other than water heaters. Um, so I, I wanted to touch on this and the rest of the stuff usually falls under plumbing leaks for a faucet or, uh, or something like that. And, and they're typical uh, minor things, but these are two of the biggest things that I find during home inspections uh, for, for plumbing anyways. Um, electrical. Electrical GFCIs, again, these are the most common things that I run into in inspections and the most common things that I get questions from realtors and from buyers as to, um, you know, why was there no GFCI uh, in the uh, bathroom or it, it's recommended. It's a recommendation and you'll see why right now. Um, a GFCI is a ground fault circuit interrupter. Say that quick, really, really, uh, really quick a few times. Uh, let's see. Back, electrocution happens when a small amount of current flows through the heart for one to three seconds and a lot less in smaller children. And this is what GFCIs are meant to do. They are meant to shut off in a 40th of a second. And the newer ones shut off a lot faster than that. If you happen to have your hands wet and you're in the kitchen, you're washing something, you reach out, you grab something electrical, you electrocute yourself, this thing will shut off. Uh, very quickly. That tester is a new tester that just came out and it actually tells me exactly the length of time it takes for this thing to shut off and most of the newer GFCI shut off in a tenth of a second now. Um, so if you don't have them in your house, uh, even for yourself, um, for the $15-$20 that it costs, I highly recommend it. Uh, in the bathrooms, and this is uh, where it gets a little tricky. Well, there's supposed to be one in the bathroom. In the bathroom, it wasn't required until 1975. So if the house is newer, it's a recommendation. Uh, it's not a requirement. In the garage, it was uh, required in 1978. In the kitchen, I was actually surprised about this one. It wasn't until 1987 that they required GFCIs in the kitchen. And then in the outside, they were required uh, all electrical outlets outside in 1973. And there's a whole list. I have them on my website of all of the other requirements like pools and uh, basements and all the other uh, areas. Um, again, this is one item that pops up on a regular basis. There's not a week that doesn't go by that I don't have this pop up on one of my inspections. Um, and there are two particular electrical panels, and there are literally thousands of these throughout Southern California that are still out there. The first one is Federal Pacific Electric. And um, of note on Federal Pacific Electric, if you get a picture or if you see an electrical panel that has uh, orange breakers or orange tips on the breakers, you probably have a Federal Pacific um, Electric panel. Uh, Federal Pacific had a lot of problems with their panels. I mean, numerous problems with their panels. Um, they were sued, um, bought by another company, and ultimately filed for bankruptcy, and they no longer exist. Um, one of the issues was bad design uh, on the panels. Uh, the breaker shut off. Half of the breaker shut off this way. Half of them shut off this way, or sometimes they'll shut off uh, to the outside. So when you try to remove the electrical panel, there is no way to remove the electrical panel without shutting off half of the breakers. And the other problem that it had is that 
breakers easily would come loose on these panels. So not only would you shut off half of the panel, but you're gonna end up removing half of the breakers from disconnecting them from the panel. Um, and it, it became a hazard with arcing. Um, loose breakers cause arcing in the panels, just like you see in this picture right here. Those were loose breakers that arced and it completely, if you see the, the 50 amp on the bottom left right there, completely melted the breaker off and then the uh, breakers next to it. Arcing caused fires. Um, fires got them the lawsuits and that's why they're no longer in business. Um, the two main problems with a Federal Pacific electric panel one of them is that the 110 uh, circuits keep running even if you shut the power off. So if, picture this, you shut the power off at the panel, you go replace a light fixture like the one I have right here, uh, you think that the wires are off, you go put the little lug nuts on them and you electrocute yourself. And uh, that happened a few times and part of the problem that they had on the, the other problem with the, the uh, 220 volt circuits, which is usually what you would have uh, a stove or a, a, an oven or a uh, heating and air conditioning system on. Um, if there was a short circuit in the system, sometimes the 220 volt circuit breakers did not shut off and causing the um, wiring to melt inside the walls and cause uh, house fires. So I always recommend when we find these um, panels in the house, it's not a matter of whether it should or it shouldn't, it should be replaced. And sometimes it throws a little bit of a wrench into the transaction um, because the panel looks good and there's no obvious damage, but this is the type of thing that you have one opportunity to find out whether it worked or didn't work. Um, in, in the United States, it was not recalled. Uh, in Canada, they went by a different name and they were recalled in Canada. Um, I won't bore you with the details, but it was political. Um, the Consumer um, Product Safety Commission didn't have the money to pursue this uh, any further and uh, ended up dropping it and not uh, asking for a recall on these. And there are literally thousands of these um, still in existence today. Uh, the other one is Zinsco, and Zinsco, uh, if you've seen a Zinsco panel, um, of note, you're going to find red breakers in there, and then you're going to see some pastel blues and pastel green breakers. Even if it doesn't have a label on it, you know you have a Zinsco panel. Zinsco panel had two what we call bus bars inside. They were very popular in the 1970s. They had two bars that ran right down the middle of the, of the inside of the panel like this. And the breakers would get uh, connected to each one of these bars all the way down to the, um, the uh, panel. Um, the problem with that, unfortunately, was that those bus bars were made of aluminum. And we came to find out that aluminum, when you heat it up, tends to deform. It'll actually start bending. And when it cools off, it'll bend in a different shape and that caused the breakers to come loose inside the panel. And they would come loose inside the panel and they would cause arcing like the picture on the left-hand side, that's exactly what happened and just burned the entire inside of the, of the panel out. So we do see those a lot during home inspections. And I, again, I know it throws a bit of a wrench in your transaction when we call these out, but this is the reason why. Arcing cause fires and Zinsco is also no longer in business. HVAC systems, um, I'm sure as a realtor, you probably know that there was back in the 1970s, um, there was a particular model or models of furnaces in attics that were recalled because they caused house fires. Um, I didn't cover them in this presentation because it's been so long that this happened um, and I see so few of them uh, throughout Southern California that I don't think it's much of an issue anymore on rare occasion. I think the last one that I found like that was maybe two years ago. I'll still run into those, but um, there is some information on my website if you want a little more information about what they are, what the model numbers are, and what they look like. Um, what I get a lot of phone calls for right now, particularly with a heat wave that we just had, and I put out a few articles about um, 
HVAC maintenance um, recently, especially with the, with the fires that we had and all the ash that was in the air. Um, I get a lot of questions about the Freon and the phase out that started in January of this year for the Freon. R22 Freon is no longer in production um, as of January 1st of this year. Um, excuse me, I have something in my eye here. Um, and we cannot import uh, R22 either. So if you have an older system, or if your client has an older system, you might want to go and check your own system at home on the tag. It'll tell you if there's R22 or R, R, R410 on there. If you have R22, uh, um, you can, for maintenance, you can only use reclaimed or recycled R22. Um, because we can't get any new R22. And unfortunately, what that's done is that it has caused the prices of Freon to go through the roof. Now, they've leveled off a little bit. I just checked it uh, last week. I updated the, um, the blog on my site uh, as to what the current prices are for Freon. Um, some older systems can and some older systems cannot be converted to the newer Freon uh, or Puron is what we call it now. Uh, R410A. If your system cannot be converted, at some point you're going to have to replace it, or you're, you're going to replace it, or your, your buyer is going to have to replace it. We don't know when. They haven't told us when uh, uh, R22 will no longer be available at all, but it's definitely something we put it on, on my inspection reports as an FYI, just something to keep on your radar. You're going to spend a little more money uh, maintaining your system. Um, and if you have a, a major malfunction with your system, sometimes it's not even worth trying to, uh, to fix and, and you'll end up having to replace it altogether. Uh, Freon right now, as of when I checked last week and I updated my blog, was going between $20 to $50, closer to $50 a pound. Uh, on average, you're going to need between 6 and 12 pounds to um, maintain um, a system on, on a service call, depending on, on the level of service that your system needs. And then there's a lot of fees that come with reclaiming uh, Freon and, uh, and the service. So you're gonna spend on average between two to $350 for just regular maintenance um, on your HVAC system if you have R22. So again, I get a lot of phone calls about this. Um, I thought I would throw it out there for you. There's an article on my website you can take a look at. Um, something to keep an eye on when you're out there uh, looking at properties or your buyers are out there looking at properties. Um, foundations. Um, this does not happen as much. Um, I would say, you know, 10% of my inspections actually have foundation problems and people tend to freak out when you say you have a foundation issue and nine out of ten times it's not an issue you have cracks on the foundation they can be repaired the picture that you see right here unfortunately is the worst kind of cracks you can find on a uh, foundation if you have horizontal cracks like this you're likely going to need a whole new foundation um, vertical cracks are 90% of what I see in, in older houses and they're perfectly normal and they're perfectly okay and they're nothing to freak out about. Um, so uh, drainage, 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 drainage is the issue. Um, water causes more damage than anything combined in any of the inspections I've done over the last 22 years, whether it be a plumbing leak, a roof leak, in this case, drainage. Uh, drainage that is sloped towards a house. I had one just yesterday. It sloped towards a house and the water was seeping into the crawl space, flooded the crawl space, causing all of the posts, which are supporting the beams for the floor, to settle unevenly. And so the whole floor inside the house was like this. Um, again, not anything out of this world. Uh, it, it can be fixed, but the, the, the first and foremost thing that needed to be fixed in that particular inspection was to fix the drainage. Um, the driveway in that particular case was sloped towards the back corner of the house and the side of the garage. So what the homeowner did is say, hey, we've got all this water. Let's put a planter area right here uh, on the side of the garage. 
um, and make use of some of this water. But unfortunately, what happened is that you're now pooling all that water right next to your garage foundation. So the whole garage foundation just went like this and it settled about two inches, causing a major crack right down the middle of the garage, causing a problem with the roof structure uh, because the roof structure was pulling down on the main beam that was in the middle. This is an older house in uh, San Gabriel and snapped the beam. And so the whole roof structure, the flat roof, you've probably seen them, they drain towards the back of the, of the garage. The whole roof structure just went like this. Um, and the underlying problem was not the roof structure, it was drainage and water. Um, and that causes the most damage to foundations that I see out there, pulling water near the foundation. Um, expansive soil, we'll go back to expansive soil. Um, areas of um, like Hawthorne and South uh, Los Angeles, there are some pockets here in the San Gabriel Valley uh, that I run into and a lot of areas in the downtown uh, Los Angeles area that have uh, expansive soil. There's a good article on my site explaining um, uh, what you can do for expansive soil. Again, it causes a lot of damage. It pushes up on foundations, it cracks foundations, it cracks slab floors, garages, driveways, things like that. There are ways that you can deal with expansive soil. Um, and believe it or not, in, during the hot summer months, one of them is to actually water the soil. Uh, people would think that why would you want to do that is because, like I mentioned, um, when it, this, this particular type of soil tends to dry, it shrinks and it pulls away from whatever is on top of it. So if that's a slab, that slab is going to go like this and it's going to break or a foundation in this case. Um, so uh, just keep in mind, like I said, a few areas here in San Gabriel Valley and Los Angeles the southern part of LA have expansive soil. Soil filled areas. Um, Santa Clarita is a good example. I was in Santa Clarita a couple of years ago and a lot of the houses when they were built there in the 1980s were built on top of fill. And um, there was this one particular uh, street uh, that, that the road went up the hill and then there was a retaining wall at the bottom of the hill on the opposite street. That retaining wall had collapsed causing all of the soil to slip. So every single house on that block up on the upper level um, had major cracks through, right through the middle of the house because the soil was slipping. And so we get that a lot. Uh, the Echo Park area has a lot of, uh, not fill, but they have some issues with slippage and you get a lot of foundation uh, damage. Um, earthquake damage, typical, uh, people uh, freak out about earthquake damage, but honestly, if uh, earthquake is a one-time thing, it happened like the one that happened this week and it's a one-time thing, it'll move your house around, it'll cause some cracks, as long as there's no major displacement on the foundation, no major settlement like this, cracks can be fixed, uh, they can be sealed, they can be fixed, and it's not, you know, people tend to freak out when they see a crack on the foundation. Um, and there's no need to. Um, the drainage issues are the big problem. It's the earthquake damage, like a uh, North Ridge quake. I still see some damage out there in the San Fernando Valley, but most of the time, it's just a matter of doing some minor repairs and uh, some patchwork. Uh, hillside, that's what I was just talking about, hillside uh, soil slippage uh, in some areas. Uh, some areas here, I'm sure you've probably seen along the 210 freeway. If anybody who's driven along the 210 freeway, there used to be rock quarries there. And those used to be enormous holes where they got all of this rock out of and now they refilled them. There's a, there's a few places along the 605 around La Puente that they did the same thing many, many years ago. And uh, the soil takes years to settle again. Um, like the one off the 210, uh, I'm sure they're going to build commercial, but there's probably going to be some residential properties. And that type of soil um, tends to settle and cause some foundation damage. Um, again, people freak out about foundation uh, cracks in the foundation. Sometimes it requires engineering. Most of the time, in my experience, it doesn't. Uh, the only time it requires engineering is when you have hillside uh, slippage. Um, even with uh, drainage issues like the one that I just did in Beverly Hills, uh, they did require a soils engineer only because there was a lot of under, underground, what we call groundwater, seeping into the foundation. Um, but 
that's about what I see uh, on foundations uh, on a regular basis. And um, hopefully this gives you a better understanding of what some of the issues are and when you should worry, when you shouldn't worry, and um, you know, when, when to run for the hills. <laughs> Um, fire safety. Now, fire safety. I'll cover. I'm. I'm. I, I. I'm very big on fire safety during my inspections. Um, and it's almost twelve. I'm running a little late, so I want to make sure I give a Q and A. So I'm going to go through the fire safety uh, requirements really quick. Um, fire safety. There are requirements. The door from the garage to the house. This is an actual fire. You see on the garage side, on the right side, right there burned that door, but because it was a solid self-closing door, the picture on the left that you see right there, the smoke barely made it into the house before they were able to turn that fire off. Um, any holes in that wall right there in the garage is a fire separation need to be patched. Uh, the door has to be a self-closing door as well. Now, recommendations. Um, how many of you, and you can answer to yourself, have solid doors on your bedrooms at home. You can go check this in your own home right now. I'm sure most of you are at home. Um, most people have the cardboard doors on their bedroom doors. The picture that you see on the upper left right there, you can see the hallway right there is completely charred. The door is the only thing that kept the fire from spreading into the bedroom where it looks like a little girl probably slept. Um, I highly recommend that you replace your bedroom doors and it's only a recommendation. This is from unfortunate experience on my part many, many years ago. Um, and that you keep your doors closed at night. Um, I know a lot of people are not used to having their bedroom doors closed at night, but the picture that you see on the right hand side is from the inside of a bedroom. And that's what happened. Uh, the fire was outside. That door prevented them from um, being in a big problem. Oh, and also have an escape plan. Um, because the doors are going to be closed at night, if part of your family is on one side of the hallway, you're on the other side of the hallway, have an escape plan uh, that nobody's going to try to go into the hallway or find each other during a fire. You get out the nearest window and you meet somewhere outside. Um, now that you have your report, I get this question a lot and we're, I know we're running a little bit late, we're running out of time. Um, so I hope you'll stick around. This is almost, almost done here. We'll get some questions and answers. Um, this is the biggest question I get uh, from realtors in particular. How much is it gonna cost to fix that? I, I give you my report. How much is it gonna cost to fix this, fix that, fix the roof? Um, and because you have to decide what you're gonna ask for um, from the seller and, and negotiate for your request for repairs. You would be surprised, and I'm very surprised this many years later, how many, how few people actually call me after the inspection to go over the report and help them decide what they should ask for and what they shouldn't, what is the important things and what is, what are not. Um, I highly recommend that you schedule a conference call with your inspector, whether it be me or somebody else, after your inspection and say, hey, look, this is what we're thinking about asking. What do you think? What are the most important things that we should be asking about? That's part of any inspector's job is to be able to uh, decipher what's a big problem and a small problem. Um, are you going to ask for repairs or are you going to ask for credit? 99% of the time I see credit, no repairs from the seller. Occasionally, um, the seller will do some repairs and then we'll do a, what was, what's called a repair verification inspection. It's just a re-inspection to verify that they've actually done what they said they were going to do. Um, you have to schedule contractors after the fact, or you can do a repair pricer, porch, home advisor. There's different services that will provide um, estimates based on your home inspection. I use repair pricer because they don't, uh, I, in my experience, uh, services like Home Advisor and Porch pester my clients and my realtors with um, offers for construction and home improvement. In one case, Porch actually ran the buyer's credit a week before they closed escrow. And of course, as you can imagine, the lender freaked out, everybody freaked out, and the buyer was not very happy. So 
Um, just an option for you to consider sometimes when you have an estimate already in hand, you don't have to schedule four or five contractors to come back into the property to give you uh, estimates on each individual thing. But I highly, again, highly recommend call your inspector, uh, discuss the inspection report afterwards to help you decide. This is what we're here for, to help you get through your, uh, your, um, your sales transaction. So with that, I will open it up to, um, to uh, questions. Here's my contact info right there. Please check out my blog. Um, this is my personal cell phone number. Um, and I invite anybody, even if you have an inspection with me or not, phone calls are always free. And I mean that. You can call me. I've been around for a long time and I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Yes, Tony. Thank you so yes. much. Very nice presentation. And we do, we do have a question here. Um, Frankie Ho asking, do you give estimate cost for repair after inspection? <laughs> That's what we, we just covered right now. Because we, yeah. we might have no idea. I get that question cost. all the time. And I can sometimes, as a contractor, um, and, and the reason why home inspectors don't do that is because if you're not a licensed contractor, you're not allowed by law to give estimates on um, repairs. And so as a licensed contractor, I can give you a ballpark. And the reason why I don't give estimates is because I'm not the one who's actually gonna do the work. And so when somebody comes in to do the work, for example, a roofer, if they uncover something else, um, that price is gonna go up. And so I don't wanna be held responsible and say, well, you said it was gonna cost this much. I can give you a ballpark sometimes uh, verbally and I'll say, hey, you know, it's gonna cost you just from experience, it's gonna cost you between this much and this much. Um, but yeah, you always wanna have a licensed contractor come in and actually do the work or maybe get one of those services that I was talking about, like a repair price or, or a porch to, to give you an, an actual written estimate. Got it, thank you. And I dialogue, uh, give you a question. Do, do you check for permit? as in a few water, like a new water heater installed, right? And the move or uh, checking with the city, if permitted, will you uh, check for the permit for us? No, we don't. Um, there are services that do, uh, do that for you, um, that will go into whatever your local municipality is and check for actual permits. Um, we don't. Um, what I'll call out is if I see something, I know how it's supposed to be installed. If I see that there's four or five things wrong with that water heater installation, like what I just uh, talked about right now, I can almost guarantee you they didn't pull a permit. Um, but uh, no, we don't actually do that. Got it. Got it. Claire, Claire Smith uh, asking you, does ADU require washer and dryer in the unit? Could two floors, a uh, single family home, build a staircase outside, uh, outside the building, not inside or inside? Um, well, uh, I'll, I'll address the first one. Um, ADUs are, are very specific to, um, to the city that you're in. They all have different requirements. The state has a certain uh, requirement for ADUs but each individual city can modify those requirements. So it really behooves you to check with your local city. Most of the time, ADUs do not require laundry hookups of any kind, um, just like you wouldn't uh, in an apartment. Um, it, it's not what we consider habitable. Uh, so there, there's no issue with habitability if you don't have a washer and dryer. Now, uh, the other side of that question is two stories. Now, were we looking to separate those as two separate units or um, maintain it as a single family? If it's a single family residence, it's required to have a stairwell inside the house leading up to the second story. If they're going to be separate, you know, now if you have the, the stairwell inside the house, um, there's nothing that says that you can't have a stairwell outside as well. You can install one outside as well. And what I see people do when they divide up units is that they will put a door at the bottom of the stairs, the interior stairs, they'll lock that door, and then they have the exterior stairs, and then the exterior stairs become the access point for, for the, the tenant upstairs, basically. So that's one way around it. 
Got it. Got it. And the uh, other question from Shay uh, asking, I think this is an AC problem. Duck is touching the vent. And then I think she, she wants to ask you your opinion. Oh, no, I think, I think she put down what was wrong with that picture for the water heater. Uh, I asked who, what was wrong with that picture. Who was it that, that did that? Picture? Shay? That, that, that comment. Can you unmute? Uh, that was my response. Shay, yes. Thank you, Shay. I will uh, get you your prize. You were right. Uh, it was, it was that the duct was touching the, uh, the vent pipe. <laughs> oh, so your client's here. <laughs> Great. And we have uh, attendees asking you the digital book link again. Can yes. you type in? Let me, uh, let me type it in right now. Um, www.inspectaproperty.com uh, forward slash down book hyphen download and again that's not a a, a public uh, URL so you won't be able to find it if you search but if you go there feel free to download it and check back because I'm almost done with a pool maintenance manual and that's going to be a separate download and they're always free and feel free to to send them out to your clients when I do pool inspections um, I always get a lot of questions and that's why I'm putting the pool maintenance manual together and that's going to be included with pool inspections. Got it. Thank you, Tony. This is conclude our Q&A session. Oh, there's another one. Yeah. There's a great there's class. class. Thank you, Judy. <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Tony. You want to tell us your cellular phone again? So yes. Can yes. Let me, uh, let me see if I could bring that back up right now. Um, or you just can announce, yeah. Well, I'll go ahead and, and, and type it into the comments right there. Um, my um, website is very easy to remember. It's www.inspectaproperty.com. It's right above my head, actually, if you, uh, if you look at it. And my, uh, <laughs> my phone number is 626-415. 8883. Uh, and I mean it, please don't hesitate to give me a call if you have any questions. You don't have to give me a home inspection, but if you have any questions, I've been around for a long time uh, and I'm always ha happy to help out. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tony, again. On behalf of West and Gabriel Valley Realtors Education Committee, we'd like to thank you for your wonderful and informative and so detailed presentation. We learned a lot from you today. And uh, don't forget, if you have any inspection, call Tony. Tony God will <laughs> give you the best service, right? And uh, yes. this is important for a smooth inspection and honor inspection report to our buyer and seller. We're going to have a successful deal go through. Before exactly. the meeting adjourned, I would like to remind you tomorrow, 11 o'clock, don't forget to check in our living trust class. Uh, the speaker will be Benjamin Ali from Ali Law Group. And this will be another wonderful section. And Wednesday, 11 o'clock, GBC Global Business Council present your number 10 country, Peru, emerging real estate market in South America. If you've never been there, come to the meeting. We bring you a very lovely cultural video at 10.50. Okay, we see you tomorrow. Everyone coming again. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Bye. For your fruitful hours, hours for us. Thank you. We see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.